please join me in the call to worship as it is printed responsively in your bulletin. Sing songs of hope and peace. God's love and power have lifted us. Sing songs of mercy and grace. God's mercy and forgiveness frame our lives. Thanks be to God for all God's love and mercy. Praise be to God for the healing power that extends to each one of us. Amen. And if you'll join with me in the gathering prayer, we sing and speak your praise, O God, grateful for the many ways in which you have healed us. Keep our hearts, our minds, and our spirits open to learn ways in which we can offer healing love for others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand before God, we think of all the ways we bicker with others, all those times we have not shown mercy and grace to those around us. Let us bow our hearts and confess our sin to God as we pray together, saying, It is never easy for us to confess, but deep down inside, we know that grace we have trouble being graceful to others. Forgiven, we are eager to judge and punish all who hurt us. Freed, we find ways to put restrictions on people we fear. Forgive us, servant God. Show us more often than we deserve. Your pardon us more times than we can count. And why? because we are the Lord's, sisters and brothers of Jesus Christ, who died and lived again, so we might live beyond death with you.
Amen. God's hand of mercy is stretched out to us, making a way through all that threatens us to touch us with grace and hope. We stand before our God, singing praise to the one who turns our despair into joy, our fears into faith. Amen. And now, forgiven and freed by God through Jesus Christ, let us be forgiven and free with one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. Please greet one another with signs of peace.
seated. If you haven't already, I invite you to please, please pass the uh, pew pads and sign in that we may know of your presence here this morning. A reminder to the worship committee that we will meet immediately at following worship, not next week. There's lunch and a movie coming up on Friday for seniors. And I would encourage you to keep your inserts handy after the sermon and the sermon hymn. We will be using a litany that's on the front page of that insert, just so you have a heads up about it. Okay. The insert is about celebrating the 300th anniversary of the Synod of the Trinity, which is 300 years old today. And the front page has the litany, and then there's information on the rest of it that you can read and learn about uh, some of the history of Presbyterianism in this area of the United States. Are there any other general announcements that need to be made? Then let us continue with our anthem.
Good morning. Good morning to everyone. How are you today? Good, I'm glad. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we do when we say the Lord's Prayer. Do you know the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and, here's the line I want you to pay attention to, and forgive us our sins or debts as we forgive our debtors or those who sin against us. Yes, we're supposed to forgive other people the way we've been forgiven. So how do you think you're forgiven? Do you ever get have to ask your parents for forgiveness and say, I'm sorry? Yeah, I bet you do sometimes. We all do. We all do. And sometimes you have to tell a friend that you're sorry that you did something or you didn't do something for them. And you ask them to forgive you, right? And when we've been forgiven, we need to share that forgiveness with other people when they say they're sorry, right? Yeah. yeah. That's what your story's going to be about today with Mrs. Atterbury. You're going to talk a lot about that. And learn some more things about it. So I won't say anything more, but I wanted to at least let you know for sure that it's important for us to forgive because God is always forgiving us. Yes, God is always forgiving us. Whenever we ask God to please forgive us, it's done. God is always forgiving. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving us so much and for giving us all the time, every time we need it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, you can go with Mrs. Atterbury. Where is she? There she is. Okay. Our prayer for elimination, elimination today is, O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love, that we may be obedient to your will and live always for your glory through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Our Old Testament reading is from Exodus, the 14th chapter, verses 19 through 31. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelites' army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on the left. 
the Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The water returned and, co and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so that the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. And then from the book of Psalms, Psalm 114. When Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became God's sanctuary, Israel his domain. The sea looked and fled, Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lambs. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back. O mountains, that you skip like rams. O hills, like lambs. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turns the rock into a pool of water, the flint, into a spring of water. And from the Gospel of Matthew in the 18th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse, which follows immediately on last week's reading. <laughs> Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, Not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. 
and seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, last week I touched on forgiveness as an important matter in the formation of community. And this week, prompted by Peter's question, Jesus really hammers it home. Forgiving people is rarely easy or comfortable, and Jesus would have us do it over and over and over and over and over and on and on. It is important to have a real understanding of what those two servants in the parable owed. The one owed the king 10,000 talents. Any idea out there how much a talent is worth? Probably not. It's worth 130 pounds of silver. That's a fairly hefty amount of silver. And in fact, it would have taken about 15 years to earn that much silver for the slave. For one talent, 15 years of hard work. And he owed 10,000 talents, which would be an impossible debt to ever repay at 150,000 years worth of salary. How could he ever have expected to pay that back if the king even had patience with him? And when the king forgave that debt, it wasn't an extension on what he owed or a reduction, but a total forgiveness for the whole debt. It was basically unimaginable. That servant who was forgiven, on the other hand, was owed 100 denarii by another servant. Now, one denarii is a day's wage. So a hundred denarii is about a hundred days wage, or at ten dollars an hour, that would be about eight thousand dollars today. Whereas the hundred and fifty thousand days of labor that the first servant owed the king would have totaled over three million dollars today so at ten dollars an hour so you can see the discrepancy and the disparity between the two amounts 
It was a large debt, that $8,000, that 100 denarii, but it was one that was technically repayable. The difference is starkly portrayed in how much was owed. 100 days versus 150,000 years. How can they possibly be compared? And if we thought about it rationally, which debt would you consider to be forgivable and which one not forgivable? And yet the king forgives the greater, immense, unbelievable debt, and the servant fails to forgive the smaller, realistic debt. My first question is a natural one. Who am I in this parable? And who, I'm sure you're asking, are you in this parable? The answer is a comforting one, at least at first, because we're not supposed to be the king. The king is God, and we cannot be God, so we're off the hook. And that's comforting. But then it's not so comfortable because it leaves us with the alternative of being the unforgiving servant. And we don't want to be that because we don't want to end up in prison. The truth is that the king forgives the unforgivable and that means that God forgives us the unforgivable. And we are only asked to forgive what is definitely forgivable, no matter how much it may seem otherwise. But the reality is we fail at that minimal forgiveness, and we fail at it over and over again, and so often we get stuck on that fact and despair of being forgiven ourselves. David Lose writes in his blog, in the meantime, I'm not sure totally, but I think that amid my despair at ever being able to forgive the way the king in the parable forgives, it occurred to me that I don't have to. That's not really what Jesus is asking. I don't have to identify with the king in this story. I can identify with the servant with the massive debt who has just been forgiven so, so much. Which means that my first job isn't to assume or insist that I must forgive incalculable debts, but simply to bask in the unbelievable forgiveness, acceptance, and grace that I have experienced and try as much as I can to live out of that. The failure of the first servant isn't simply that he won't forgive his comrade, but that he has just experienced an utterly unexpected, completely beyond his wildest dreams, life-changing moment of grace, and, it seems, and he seems absolutely untouched by it. And for this reason, he lives devoid of any sense of gratitude. His whole life changed, and he didn't even notice. Is that us, too? Has our whole life changed at some point, and we didn't even notice? We didn't feel it happening and see the world from a new vantage point? I can relate to that because I know I have been wronged in a way that I could not forgive, at least not on my own. I've told you that story about my mother's death at the hands of a drunk driver some 34 years ago. It was a tragedy, and it was something that I personally could not forgive on my own. But somehow I finally came to the point where I told God, you are going to have to do it. And of course, it happened. 
in the blink of an eye, I felt that forgiveness wash through me. I think it was the same for the relatives of the people killed two years ago in Charleston who were doing nothing but attending a church Bible study when they were killed. Yet even before the trial began, many of their relatives forgave the shooter. I don't think that's an entirely human thing. I think that's a willingness to let God take over. But what happens when we are the one who is not forgiven by another? What happens when we know our debt and ask to be forgiven for it, only to be refused by the other? And especially when it's a member of the church who won't forgive you, how can we respond to that? I think that we can and should ask God for the forgiveness knowing that God is a merciful God, knowing that God will hear our plea. We ask the forgiveness we crave from the one who is in charge of all and accept it when it is given to us by God, even if we don't ever get it from the person we need it from. I think many folk in this congregation are in that situation that they have asked forgiveness of another only to be rebuffed or shunned and some have been blamed for things they never did or certainly never meant to do for those who feel that they are being asked to apologize for something that they don't feel they ever did that is something we have to trust to god to the king to deal with in due time, just as the king did in the parable. Since God is such a merciful and forgiving God who has gone to the length of strength, sacrificing his only beloved son for us to know that truth of how loving and merciful God is, it is our calling to live our lives as mercifully as we possibly can, to rely on God to do it for us so that the mercy might abound. Can we admit that it is in forgiveness that there is healing, that in forgiveness there is possibility and hope, that is the question I will leave you with for today. If there is a truly unforgivable sin someone has enacted against you, can you take it to God and just say, then you do it? Because God has and will forgive and forgive and forgive and forgive beyond our wildest dreams. Let us pray. God of freedom, you brought your people out of slavery with a mighty hand. Deliver us from our captivity to pride and indifference to the needs and gifts of others, that we may be ready to love as you have loved us and to even give as we have received. This we pray in Christ's holy name, amen.
now to the litany and the insert to your bulletin. We will extol you, our God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. We celebrate this day so long ago on which we were called to serve you in new ways. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. God's greatness is unsearchable. A day on which we were challenged to become new, that your church and its witness might grow. One generation shall laud your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. Through the years you have changed and challenged us, pursued and pushed us to live out your hope in the world. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works we will meditate, reminding us always to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness above our own desires. The might of your awesome deeds shall be proclaimed and we will declare your greatness. Still today, you call us through the present age and into tomorrow with eyes fixed on Jesus, voices sharing your grace and hands and feet engaging the world with your justice and mercy. Together we shall celebrate the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Amen and amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I would share with you that Logan Ford had an emergency appendectomy this week but he is home, and we are thankful for that, that he is doing well, and that Sharon Evans is at home, continuing to recover, and we're doing well, and we're grateful for that as well. Are there other joys or concerns that need to be shared? Evelyn? Okay, Robert had to have something done a second time because the first time it wasn't working properly. A permanent port. Okay. Anything else? Evelyn asks us to pray for a miracle for Robert. Let us pray together in this prayer which is a bidding prayer. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond, hear our prayer. Praying for others is not an easy out of responsibility. It is a pledge of our intentions. Let us pray. Dear God, how do you keep track of us all? So many people, some, so many needs, so much suffering. Yet you love each like the most generous of fathers and feel their pain like the most loving, devoted of mothers. Help us to be inclusive in our loving like you are. For the suffering and those who ease their pain, the sorrowful and those who try to comfort their grief, the diseased and those who work for their healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the abused and those who seek justice for them, the weak and those who lend them unmeasured support, the heavy laden and those who share the load, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer for the misunderstood and those who listen, the timid and those who speak up for them, the lost 
and those who will suffer to see their recovery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the strong and those who keep them gentle, the wise and those who keep them humble, the kind and those who shield them from overstretching themselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the violent and those who must arrest them, the cruel and those who must contain them, the corrupt and those who must judge and sentence them, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the strong in faith and those who learn from them, the battlers and those who affirm them, the happy and those who rejoice with them, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For peacemakers and those who trust them, the leaders and those who vote for them, the opinion makers and those who are swayed by them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Compared with you, holy friend, our compassion is miserly and our circle of care is almost meager. Nevertheless, we want to be more like you asking that you will conscript our prayers and actions into the work of your universal salvation. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord, who gave us our family prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth.
mighty and merciful God, from whom comes all that is good. We praise you for your mercies, for your goodness that has created us, your grace that has sustained us, your discipline that has corrected us, your patience that has borne with us, and your love that has redeemed us. Help us to love you and to be thankful for all your gifts by serving you and delighting to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. to the world with love in your hearts, knowing the grace and mercy that God has bestowed upon you, and share it with others. Do it to love God and to serve God. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be kind and gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Alleluia and amen.